Well, as uh, Dewey said, um, today is Memorial Day weekend, and um, some of you remember that it used to be called uh, what? Decoration. Decoration Day. I knew there'd be some of you that remember this. This is a history lesson for those of you who weren't around when that was changed in 1967. That's when they changed things, but um, Memorial Day weekend, it used to be May 30th was Memorial Day. That was basically it. And um, so uh, it has changed, but as Dewey indicated, it's largely for us to remember those who died uh, in war or in uh, combat or in military service, but also just remembering those who passed on uh, in whatever way that it might be. And so uh, the, the first Memorial Day, as I understand it, give you a little history lesson here before we dive into the text this morning, was, um, of course, right after the Civil War and at Arlington National Cemetery uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, James Garfield, General James Garfield, presided over the service there. And uh, he was the guy that would uh, serve as president of Hiram College he would be president of the United States for a short time because he was assassinated. But he was also an elder in the Christian churches and churches of Christ, and he preached quite a bit. And wouldn't it be great to have a president who'd preach every now and then? Uh, from the Bible, of course. <laughs> a lot of them preach, but uh, kind of got myself in deeper there, didn't I? <laughs> but at any rate, he gave a speech that day at Arlington, and then this is what's fascinating to me. 5,000 volunteers that day decorated 20,000 graves in Arlington National Cemetery. And I just can't imagine 20,000 graves. But at any rate, that was kind of uh, the first part of our history. Of course, most of you have probably done something this weekend about decorating graves. Uh, Joyce and I went up to uh, Highland Cemetery in south of my hometown of Baird and uh, decorated my mom and dad's grave a couple weeks ago due to our schedule. And, um, you know, as w we did that, I looked at their grave, then I looked around, and of course in small town you recognize names that, uh, of people that you're associated with. So it brings back memories, and that's the design of Memorial Day, is to help us to remember. And in your faith in Jesus Christ, this idea of memory is very important too. So I hope that just uh, this uh, weekend uh, is more than just... Uh, uh, getting a good uh, camping spot at Cherry Glen, is it, up there in Sailorville, uh, which is fine. Uh, it's about remembering, and I hope on this Memorial Day that you uh, will do that. What I want to just talk to us for a few minutes is about looking forward to heaven. I wondered, well, what, what do I say on Memorial Day? We could go a lot of directions, but I just uh, had been uh, doing some study uh, in Revelation and uh, came across again chapter 21, and I thought, hmm, this might make a good uh, Memorial Day uh, sermon. So I guess you'll be the judge of that this morning. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, which I didn't have put up on the board, but uh, if you, at about any Christian funeral, you will hear uh, possibly John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions or rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. That's kind of the beginning of the emphasis on heaven. And Jesus, our Lord, is the one who brought it to the forefront. That's called his farewell address. It precedes a time with his disciples in the upper room, the prayer in John 17, the trip to Gethsemane and all of that. So it's very important. And Jesus said a lot about heaven and a lot about hell. So I just hope that you understand that this morning uh, on the importance. Now, when you start talking about heaven, uh, it's, it's kind of like a guy was asked, are you afraid to die? And he said, well, yes. 
Well, what do you mean? He said, I'm afraid because I've never done it before. <laughs> Most of us have a little fear when we haven't done something. Well, my problem here today outside of the scripture will be try to get you and me to see heaven. But I haven't been there yet, and we have some things in the Bible. And, you know, it's hard to describe some things. Now, I have been several places, as you have, and so we could talk, and you could describe some wonderful place uh, because you've been there, and I could get a pretty good picture of what that might be. Uh, Joyce and I have been to Turks and Caicos. That's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. The white beaches and the uh, waters of the Caribbean are beyond description in Turks and Caicos. And we've been at the Grace Bay part, which is up here, down below a uh, little bit to Grand Turks, where the tr cruise ship, uh, ships uh, stop. Is, uh, it's, it's a marvelous place, but because I've been there, I can probably tell you, but you've got to see <laughs> those beaches and that water to really understand it. What I want you, if you get nothing else out of what I've got to say this morning, I hope I can cast a vision for heaven is the ultimate goal for the Christian. And I want the glimpse of heaven to be your motivation for living for Christ as best you can each day. If I can motivate you for that, I will feel like I have done my job this morning. Now think with me, if you would, for just a moment. We are created in the image of God. Genesis 1, 27. He created male and female. Uh, he created us in the image of God. Now, what that means is a lot of things, but one of the things it means is we have a peace, if I can use that word, a peace of God in us. Because he created us. Now, we can't become a God, but we can have a peace of God in us. And so, he also gave us the power of choice. But as you know, we are people of free will. And guess what? Human, be human beings do a lot of things, don't they? And so, we go our way... Uh, some days we're better at living for Christ and other days it's not as good. Or maybe you're before even being a Christian and you're going your way as you see fit. We have the power of choice. But because of that, we have sinned. And you know what? We can, we can do something about our sin, but only do something about, and that's to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We can't take it away ourselves, and so we have to have a Savior, and that amazing God that put a piece of us in each one of us has given us a way to come to him through his son, Jesus Christ. See, we have a spiritual nature. This is one of the things I've learned in, in my time as a chaplain. Uh, people say, well, do you see everybody or do you just wait for people to call you? And I say, no, I go to see everybody that I can. And, uh, and now I'm not trying to convert everybody there because you can't do that. But uh, if you want to talk about spiritual things, we'll talk about spiritual things. And if you don't, we'll just, I, I tell people I've come here to meet you and I want to see how you're doing. Well, the point of it is I've learned every last one of us, even the ones that don't know it, have a spiritual nature because God created us. So even the hardened sinner that's never even thought about coming to Christ has a spiritual nature. And you know that everybody has a certain means whereby we operate, and that's because we have a spiritual nature. So... He sent his son Jesus, and we know that John 3.16 is the cornerstone of the Bible, and we can become the new creation by faith, repenting of our past, 
being baptized into him, receiving forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now we have another presence when you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit working in your life. And that's a wonderful thing because we're forgiven of our sins past, but now we need the Holy Spirit present and future to help us with the sin that we, yes, you will still sin even though you have decided to be a follower of Jesus. All of this being said, folks, what's going to motivate you to follow Jesus now that you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior? I would like to say that our glimpse of heaven should be part of that motivation. There's a lot of motivations we will have to follow Christ and continue to follow Christ, but I hope one of them today, or if you already have thought about this, can be a glimpse of heaven. And so we need to have that each day. Now, I know not every day is going to be heavenly. Please understand that. But I just know that that can serve as a motivation because many days we've got to be motivated for that. So the book of Revelation tells you a lot of things. Now, uh, Revelation is one of the books that people either never read or they obsess on. You can turn the radio or TV on any day, and you can find some guy that's going to have a sermon on Revelation. It may be good or it may not be very good, but it'll get a hearing. It'll get a crowd. So we have those, those uh, two extremes. I never touch it, or that's all I can talk about. Well, as one, buddy, as one guy observed that uh, to not read and think about Revelation is like reading a book and never reading the last chapter. We don't do that because we don't, we don't know how it ends. Well, that's what you need to be thinking about. How's it going to end? If you can just get through your head that you don't need to be worried about trying to figure out when all this is going to happen, but know that it's going to happen before Jesus comes again, you'll be all right. And so we find some things in there that are really helpful to us. My... Um, and, and again, I just want to tell you just a couple things about Revelation is it will explain itself many times, and many of the symbols come right out of the Old Testament. And again, the reason it was written is because the people at the time were being persecuted by the rulers of Rome, and they needed to be overcomers. And so John partly writes that to help us overcome. So that's why we need to think about it. My uh, preaching professor was an interesting guy. His name was Don DeWelt. And uh, I've probably told you this before, but uh, like I've said before, old men repeat themselves, as my family remind me. Uh, but this is good several times, I think. Uh, if you ever saw him, he preferred to be called Brother DeWelt. He was a professor, but Brother was what he liked to be called. And if you said, Good morning, Brother DeWelt, how are you? And he would just have one stock answer. I'm happy, and I'm on my way to heaven. Well, I would dare you to try that on a few people tomorrow and see what kind of a result you get. If somebody asks you tomorrow, how are you? And you give them that, they'll never forget it. <laughs> I just know that that is uh, something we can bank on. And, of course, I, I, I heard a, a preacher say one time that he said, I want to go to heaven, and I want to take as many people with me as I can. And I like that. Now, some of you uh, who are baseball fans and students of the game get to go back a number of years to, to remember the name of Pepper Martin. Pepper Martin was a baseball player, St. Louis Cardinals, for all you Cardinals fans. And... Uh, in fact, there's even a game that you play in warm-up they call Pepper that they get from him. Now, of course, that was a nickname. But at any rate, almost single-handedly one year, he won the World Series. And uh, so the reporters gathered around like they always did and said, well, Pepper, what do you want to do next? You've won the World Series. He said, I want to go to heaven. 